Dr. Rothschild is a senior scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, as well as adjunct professor at Brown University. Her research is focused on how life has evolved, both here and potentially elsewhere. Recently, she brought her creativity to the burgeoning field of synthetic biology, articulating a vision for the future as an enabling technology for NASA's missions, including human space exploration and astrobiology. Since 2011, she's been a faculty advisor on the award-winning Stanford-Brown iGEM team, which has pioneered the use of synthetic biology to accomplish NASA's missions, particularly focusing on the human settlement of Mars, astrobiology, and the innovative technology she will be discussing tonight. Her lab is moving these plans into space on a DLR satellite called Eucrobus, which was launched from Vandenberg on December, this December 3rd. And we're very eager to hear about that. She's also a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London, the California Academy of Sciences, the Explorers Club. In 2015, she was awarded the Isaac Asimov Award for the American Humanist Association and was the recipient of the Horace Mann Award from Brown University. She's been a NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Fellow three times, most recently this year. She frequently appears in documentaries, TV, radio, and she lectures worldwide, including Windsor Castle, Comic-Con, and the Vatican. <laughs> How can we design a strategy for the search for life elsewhere, or to understand what the future will hold for life on Earth and beyond without extrapolating from pre chemistry and evolution. The origin and evolution of life often seems an unpredictable odyssey, but can we predict an alien life form? Join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn Rothschild for her insights tonight. Like a brown dwarf, 
and therefore you wouldn't have had the three billion years or four billion years to get an intelligent life form. And it's, you know, to me that's just mind-bogglingly naive because we have one book. So it would be sort of like me walking into the department chair in English literature um, at Brown and saying, I would like to have a faculty position in the literature department. And he said to me, well, how many books have you read? I said, well, one, but you know, I read it over and over. I really know it. You know, of course, you'd be laughed out of the room. But that's the position that we're in with biology. We only have one example of life. Now, I, used, I, I took this slide out, but as your astronomers, I got to Ames, I will admit, several decades ago. And I felt a little snooty because at the time there was only one solar system known as well. So I thought, well, I can always go into the lab and do something every day. And you people have to wait for new sets of data coming down from a mission. Well, here we are in a post-Kepler era, and I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with Kepler. Kepler mission looking for um, extrasolar planets, and it's been spectacularly successful. We now have examples of literally thousands of solar systems. And guess what? We still only have one narrative for the history of life on Earth. So I said, we don't even know how long it took for life to originate. We don't know how fast it was, whether any of these details would happen again. So what I'm going to do is give you a much more philosophical talk than you're probably used to tonight to sort of get at what we could possibly predict if we're looking for life elsewhere and then flip around at the end and give this bonus talk that is very much data-driven, except for the fact that we don't have any data yet. So that's what I was doing. <laughs> when I was being introduced, I, I was not being really rude, but um, satellite passes over the tracking stations a certain number of times a day. And I was told by our engineers we might have an update at 7, so I was hoping to be able to get up here and give you get a brand new data that, um, sadly, they're not going to pick it up until the next pass. So anyone who wants to stay here at midnight, <laughs> you're welcome. But anyway, um, in the meantime, let's go back to this talk. So what is life? So let me give you a non-natural definition for life. And I'm very grateful to Carol Cleland at the uh, University of Colorado for pointing out this quote of Da Vinci's. So what he wrote is water is sometimes sharp, sometimes strong, sometimes acid, sometimes bitter, sometimes sweet, sometimes thicker thin, Sometimes it's seen bringing hurt or pestilence, sometimes health-giving, sometimes poisonous. It suffers change into as many natures as different places through which it passes, and on and on and on. I would suspect that there is not a person in the audience who would give that definition of water. You're asked what water is? It's H2O. End of story. We can define it chemically. And the reason I love showing this is because I believe that where we are with life right now is that kind of definition that da Vinci gave. It's sort of a description. Well, it has to do this or it has to do that, but we don't really know. It's a description. So my big question is, is there an H2O definition of life and we just don't know it yet? Or maybe there is no H2O definition of life whatsoever, in which case we're going to continue to have to do the sort of things that I'm doing tonight with you. So let's start with a couple of things that I do think we can make a strong argument and then see what's, um, what comes out of it. So I believe strongly that life is an emergent proper process based on physical components. So it's not an object. You can't say, that is life, that is life. Life is a process. Um, but the process includes fighting entropy. So we're fighting randomness. And that's what you were doing tonight when you ate dinner. And looking around the room, I don't think there's anyone in the room who's still growing up. So what you're doing to eat is to fight entropy. Okay? So, you know, you feel like that extra brownie tonight, you can say, well, you know, it's been a tough day on the entropy front. <laughs> um, but the key point here, I believe, is that the physical components are going to be based on organic carbon chemistry. And I'm sure everyone in the room knows that organic carbon is not carbon in the organic carbon section of the grocery store, but it's carbon that's bonded to hydrogen, um, hydroxyl groups of OHs, and so on. So except for carbon dioxide and diamonds and graphite and carbon monoxide, basically everything that carbon does is organic carbon, and it does an awful lot. And so 
if you start to buy this carbon thing, well, let, let me tell you why I'm going to argue carbon, because I do believe it's non-negotiable. So here's the periodic table, and there's carbon to help you out. So it turns out it's the fourth most abundant element in the universe. So that's great, lots of carbon. Um, I love showing this picture, particularly to astronomy groups. So this is the astronomer's periodic table. Boy, I wish the biologists had had one like that. It's so much easier because you can really get the feel for the relative amounts in so many elements once you get over hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and then uh, manganese, iron, silicon, a few others, are almost negligible. So yeah, there's a lot of carbon around. And what's actually kind of interesting is look at the ones that are particularly abundant. Those are the ones that are really important in life, too. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. I've just been starting to show that slide. And then metals. So we really are made of a lot of metals. There's not that many proteins in our body that don't have some interaction with the metal. People seem really shocked by this. You know, I'm not made of metal. Sure you are. And then they say, OK, so which metals? And I always say, somewhat sarcastically, look at the back of a vitamin bottle. So I now <laughs> handily provided a vitamin bottle for you so you can see what metals your body uses. And here's a little bit more legible version of it. So we could have gone on and on to others, but here are a lot of the major metals in blue that we use in our bodies. So it's, there's lots of it. It can form lots of really interesting compounds from methane to DNA and so on. So these really complicated ones which silicon really can't do. It can do some interesting chemistry, but nothing compared to carbon. Nothing beats carbon. And what's interesting is our colleagues who have looked in the interstellar medium that looked between the stars see organic carbon chemistry. And that to me is really stunning. So it means for a start that the building blocks for life as we know it are out there among the stars. So it suggests that at least to start with, in a first order, the building blocks for life that we use are the same ones that are being used elsewhere if there's life elsewhere. Or as I like to say, if there are any kids on, around Alpha Centauri, they're basically using the same chemistry book that we had to use in school. The difference is obviously it's an Alpha Centaurian, but it is organic carbon chemistry. And then, I mean, let's face it, we actually don't live on a great place for organic carbon chemistry in that the vast majority of this, the um, surface mantle of planet Earth is actually silicate. So look at all that oxygen and silicon, which together make silicate. <coughs> And then look at how much carbon there is. It's a very, very tiny fraction of the surface material on planet Earth. And yet, even with that game, we are made of organic carbon chemistry. So if you buy my argument so far, basically everything else is going to flow <coughs> from that, including, for example, our relationship to the electromagnetic spectrum. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum handily put there. We as organisms use a very, very tiny fraction, a little bit of the UV, what we call visible between um, 400 and 750 nanometers, same region that plants use for photosynthesis, and then a little bit into the infrared. You know, there's some pythons, for example, that use infrared to track their prey. There are a few bacteria that use some of the infrared for photosynthesis and so on. But basically, we're in this narrow wedge. Well, we're based on organic carbon. All organic carbon absorbs in the UV. It's dangerous for it. So if everyone's based on organic carbon, you want to stay away from the UV. So if you've got a planet that is just being bathed with ultraviolet radiation, maybe that's not a great place to be out on the surface. And then conversely, if you're too much in the infrared, there's just not that much energy there. So I'm already saying the place that we are in the electromagnetic spectrums a great place to be, and so if there are other creatures that are able to access it for photosynthesis or have some kind of vision, they're again going to be using that same sort of narrow band that we do. And so then the next thing is solvent. Why water? We use water, right? Well, it's very widespread, again, just like the games with the carbon, and it's got a lot of great chemical properties. So a couple of years ago, I was for some reason, like the actor or banquet speaker for the 
um, Dutch water association. So, you know, I had to string this out for an hour, so I had about 50 reasons that water was great. I'm not going to spend the rest of the night, although I will point out that it's got an interesting property in this one of the few compounds that is less dense when it's solid than when it's liquid. <coughs> so that means, first of all, you get great, you know, great sort of um, side effects when you're having a gin and tonic. But also it means that you can have ice-covered moons like Enceladus and Europa. The Enceladus, of course, being the ice-covered moon of Saturn and Europa of Jupiter. Um, and then have liquid water beneath the surface. Because think if it were the reverse, it would be frozen solid. <coughs> and so that's given us many, many more places to look for life because of this um, situation where frozen water is less dense than liquid water. Um, and then, say, if we play this numbers game, remember there's the astronomer's periodic table, tons of hydrogen, fair amount of oxygen there, so it's number three, so you put them together, you've got water. So here's a great um, picture that was released a few years ago by NASA. And what you're seeing is the solar system starting to form, and you can see this water vapor cloud. So you can imagine that that's going to ultimately be a ring of comets and you know, um, uh, moons and planets and so on with very, very heavy water inventory. So presumably this, if you've been able to take a, an image of our own solar system when it started to form um, four and a half or so billion years ago, this would have been roughly what it would have looked like. So this is a lovely story. We need water, we need organic carbon chemistry. And then we look at Titan, this moon of Saturn. And I'm sure many of you remember when the Cassini mission dropped on the surface of Titan. And what was interesting is it looked so familiar. I didn't do this to you tonight, but sometimes when I'm in a particularly ornery mood, I take a picture that um, I took out of a plane landing at O'Hare in Chicago and just pixelated and turned black and white. And to me, it looks very much like the Cassini images landing um, on the surface of Titan. You see the lakes, you see the mountains, you don't see the Natural History Museum, but you know, not yet, you can't have everything. But what's kind of interesting here is it's so cold that the liquid there is ethane and methane, and the solids are things like frozen ice. So it's so familiar and yet so bizarre. So here is a moon that's got more organic carbon than any other place in our solar system. So you think, great, priority number one to go. But we don't think there's liquid water, at least not on the surface. We now think there may be some beneath the surface. And so wouldn't it be cool if there was a life form that uses organic carbon chemistry but does not need liquid water? Here is your place. Um, so there are people, um, we've played a little bit with it, trying to imagine a life form that doesn't need liquid water uses another solvent. But to be honest, I think that the biggest problem with this idea, appealing though it is, is it's so darn cold that you're going to have, um, if there's an organism there, affected by radiation. And its metabolism will be so slow because it is so cold that it will not be able to fix the, um, any damage that it's getting from radiation. So I think that that's one of the strong arguments for why you don't have life on the surface of Titan. But I say the more recent models suggest that there could be liquid water beneath the surface. One idea is, you know, now and again, particularly early on um, in the evolution of our solar system, you get impactors in and you get local heating for some period of time. And so you've got water maybe mixing with the organics in the surface and, you know, everything's great and then it sinks or whatever. Um, but anyway, I, I do, I have spoken um, at the Vatican twice, and I have some very good friends in the observatory, and I point out that Titan was probably just put in our solar system to test our faith in liquid water. <laughs> so, we go back to the puppy here. So, so I've said, you know, look, we've got to have organic carbon, we've got to have liquid water, we get this definition that's not H2O, but, um, you know, we, it's some sort of process that fights entropy. So now we've got this next problem, number four, is that we have the environment giving constraints. So I gave you the whole argument with radiation, but there are many other environmental constraints. Here's a picture of a field site a couple of times in the Rift Valley in Kenya. And I love showing this picture, partly because it shows high temperature, high pH, a couple of things in one picture, and also because it's got a double rainbow, which was so incredibly cool that day. Um, but it is a great picture to, sh to remind us that there are all sorts of extremes. 
know these temperature extremes, and we know about life down to active at about minus 21, <coughs> up to about 120 um, Celsius. And you think, whoa, that's amazing because liquid water should only be zero to 100. But there's some tricks that these organisms use, and just a few degrees you can buy with antifreeze, basically, you know, producing it in your body. But then, you know, people think, whoa, that's pretty incredible. And then I, I like to tell people, wait, let's just stop the right brain, left brain stuff. Who here has heard of penguins? Yeah. You know, polar bears. We it can even go out to <laughs> zero. There are lots of organisms that are metabolically active. But you grow feathers or fuller or fat or whatever. And um, I may have told you this a couple years ago. I always think at this point in the talk of giving this talk once at a university only slightly west of here, which I will not name. And I said that, and the professor raised his hand and said, oh, but they're cheating. They have fur. No, there, it's not a guidebook that says, you know, uh, on page 47 it says if you grew fur or evolved blubber, that doesn't count. Of course it counts. And in some ways we could say it's perfectly reasonable that we have evolved to be able to manufacture coats and sweaters um, and heated houses. So we are actually able to inhabit much colder regions. So the temperature pH, of course, very acidic, all the way, the organisms down around zero, probably a little bit less now, up to 12 and a half, 13. High pressure, low pressure, salinity, chemical extremes, radiation we talked about. Oxygen also is, is something that's really nasty, but most people don't talk about because we do that. We breathe oxygen. We're sitting in about a 21% oxygen environment right now. So don't stop breathing. This is a great thing. This has allowed us to evolve, to be know, intelligent creatures that are very active and so on, we're able to metabolize in this cold room, and so on. But it's also very dangerous because while water and oxygen are fine, it's all these radicals in the middle, hydroxyl radicals and so on, that are extremely dangerous and toxic. So that's why we've evolved to detoxify them and try to protect ourselves. And any organism that's playing around with water and oxygen through different um, different redox states is going to have the same problem because of the damage to organic carbon chemistry. So you can see this all keeps coming back to if we're playing with organic carbon chemistry, there are certain things you can predict about its metabolism. So let's try one other thing. Well, natural selection. You know, I started with Darwin. Natural selection is, is pretty straightforward. We produce more young than can survive. Who's going to survive? The ones that are in some way better adapted to being able to produce children. Or as a professor I TA for once when I was a grad student used to say, children are parents' ways of getting grandchildren. And that pretty much sums up natural selection for you. And I would be remiss in not pointing out that I believe that any crazy mechanism you can think of for evolution, there is probably a beetle in the Amazon <coughs> that has already thought of it. <laughs> so we're really just talking about what the, the predominant um, form is. So let's see, I think I had one more for you here. Ah, yes. So you want to look about the likelihood of, the, of inputs like solar radiation, water, we talked a little bit about that. But once you go through all these things, I think you can have some near-term predictive power. So for example, looking at what part of the electromagnetic spectrum you're going to use, or what sort of pH range you might be able to use, and so on. So you've got some sort of general metabolic parameters now, just based on these arguments. So for example, um, if you start to play these games, let's look a little bit at what amino acids you might use to make proteins. So this probably means very little to you, except we normally use about 20 or so amino acids. We meaning all life on Earth, not just you know, those of us in the room. But what is really interesting is this chart that was put together with some Canadian colleagues of mine, that if you look at meteorites, stardust, analogs, prebiotic experiments, hydrothermal synthesis, and so on, there's a pecking order. You get a lot more glycine than everything else. It's, a, it's the simplest amino acid, not surprising. And then alanine and aspartate, and glutamate, and valine, and so on, all the way down Past histidine, all these others here are not even made by um, uh, any other way except biologically. So if you're looking at this, knowing that you've got a lot more glycine, for example, in meteorites and these analog experiments and hydrothermal vents and so on, 
it's not such a stretch to say, if you're going to find life elsewhere, I bet it's got some glycine in it and a good chance of alanine and aspartate and so on. You can start to see these gains. So you're now starting to even say what the, um, what the amino acids are made out of. We've got a lot of proteins in our body. Peptides are, are small proteins. It turns out you can take some of these things like alanine and have a shock impact. So in other words, you're mimicking the impact of a meteorite hitting the earth and you can end up with these short peptides, these short proteins up to three and four amino acids. This is not biologically made. This is just made by mimicking an asteroid, a meteorite hitting the earth. So you're already talking yourself into the fact you don't need life to start to make these proteins and so on. And you know, I can argue which ones, um, which amino acids are gonna be more likely. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the components of our cell, lipids, fats can be formed abiotically and they form little vesicles that are like the little cells in our own body. Um, you can do it at home. You probably may be, some of you have done it tonight. To take oil and water, or vinegar and water, or lemon juice water, shake it, and you've made these little tiny vesicles. So not difficult. You imagine if you have lipids around and water, and you've got um, the tide churning, or maybe you know um, something going on in a pond. It's raining or whatever. You've got these little vesicles being formed anyway. And the amino acids, I told you, could be made all sorts of different ways. And you can start to make peptides and so on without enzymes, without life. But then you get into things like RNA, which um, has a lot of functions in our cells from mostly um, taking the information from DNA and using it to make proteins. And a, a lot of people believe that that was the origin of life, that there was an RNA world era I don't believe you could have without the, um, without the proteins. But the fact is that you do find bases in the abiotic settings. You don't actually ever find RNA. But you can have bases. You can stick them onto sugar so you've got the building blocks of RNA. And then you can start to make these polymers, um, again, totally abiotically. So I have a colleague, Dave Diemer at UC Santa Cruz, who's done some great work um, looking at the splash zone in hydrothermal vents and putting these monomers in and you get the heating and the drying and the heating and the drying and you start to get long chains formed. So again, completely without having life intervening. So all these things could easily happen multiple places without life. And then there's DNA and many people seem to think you go around the solar system looking for DNA, which I think is kind of idiotic and I've told some of them that. Uh, I trust that none of you are as naive. We've never found DNA out there. Um, it is made from RNA in our cells. Um, whether this was a difficult step once you had RNA or something fairly trivial. I used to say it was trivial and then I started thinking about it and now I'm not entirely sure how trivial it is. But that means that I'm less sure about DNA being found in other places. And I just put the flagella in because that's right. So, Let's, let's see where we are at this point. If we replayed the tape, if we looked elsewhere for life, yeah, I think that we could pretty much argue that you're gonna have an organic carbon chemistry similar to us, and therefore you can predict certain things about at least metabolism and interactions with the environment. But that's, unless you're real chemistry geeks, that's not, sort of the fun stuff. You want to know if we're going to get another alien or if we're going to get, you know, a giraffe on planet X or whatever. So we have to sort of go to the next step, which is slightly more fanciful. Because as I told you at the beginning, we only have one example of life. We only have one. So we're doing sort of pseudo replicates here. And to do that, what we do is we look from at convergence. Whether multiple organisms have independently come up with the same solution to the same problem. So here's a picture I took in Santa Fe a couple weeks ago of a cactus. And anyone figure out what that is? Well, backside of a porcupine. <laughs> okay, and there's um, a rose, and there's a whistling thornicacia. They all have come up with the same solution to being eaten. They all make thorns, basically say, don't eat here, you're gonna get a mouthful of thorns. So again, completely independently, 
And so you figure if you're at some certain level of evolution, you can come up independently with that same solution. So it's not unreasonable to think that that might happen elsewhere. So what I'd like to do in the rest of this part of the talk is give you many examples of convergence to see what we might see happening elsewhere. Um, so I call this, sort of fancifully, great moments in evolution. Um, there are many other great moments in evolution, I'm sure, but um, these are some major ones that I'd like to go through with you for a moment. So let's start with um, metabolic pathways. I'll give you the example of photosynthesis. So she's an example that took a picture I took in Sweden a few months ago. Photosynthesis is so incredibly important for life on Earth. So this is the primary way we take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it into organic matter. When I say we, again, life on Earth, um, and unless you're photosynthetic, um, you know, you thank a plant today, or um, an alga, or a cyanobacterium, they're the big ones that, um, that are photosynthetic, because everything else has to eat that. Could it evolve again? Well, I mean, it was a great idea um, once you're able to make your own sugars or lipids or proteins or whatever, you don't have to rely on all these mechanisms like shock impact synthesis and so on, so it's a great idea. Um, if you're using solar power, so it's photosynthesis, the sun is an essence, a limitless source of power. I sort of laugh when my colleagues say, but photosynthesis is so efficient. It's like, yeah, I mean, there's so many photons, it really doesn't matter if you waste it with you. There's tons of it. We use a tiny fraction of the photons that reach planet Earth. And of course, every solar system is going to have a star. That's by definition. Um, so if you combine these two great ideas, that there's the sunlight, you want autotrophy, there's you can see selection pressure. So let's look at some of the components you would need. Well, in the physical environment, you need energy in the form of light. You know, with an astronomy group, I need hardly point out that you've got um, the sun is a great source of, of solar energy by definition, and inorganic carbon is all over the place. So I don't think you're going to have trouble finding um, carbon dioxide. Actually, for carbon monoxide, you probably wouldn't have too much trouble there. So here's an example of the solar radiation that reaches planet Earth, tons of it. We'll go back to that picture for another reason later. They said lots of inorganic carbon, certainly plenty. Um, we're actually tiny amount, you know, people worry about. CO2 levels rise in the atmosphere. It still is a tiny fraction of Earth's atmosphere. Um, it was, we think, orders of magnitude higher when life arose, and it came down because of things like photosynthesis drawing down the CO2. You go to some place like Mars, it's 95% CO2 in the atmosphere. There are lots of it around. So let's say the physical environment is going to occur all over the place. What about the biological prerequisites? So you need some kind of pigment that's going to be able to grab the energy from the light and shunt it into something useful within a, an organism. You need to be able to, um, oxygenic photosynthesis, you need to be able to reduce that carbon dioxide so that it becomes a sugar. Um, and you're going to need some enzyme that, that does this work of actually taking the CO2 and converting it um, to sugar, adding it maybe to another compound. And you might need a selection pressure to make that happen. So um, again, let's look at convergence. Every one of these, all five of these, are a category of light harvesting proteins that has de uh, of, of pigments that has evolved independently. Whether you're talking about chlorophylls and bacterial chlorophylls, I've given you sort of one example of that in that top picture, or carotenoids um, here, long compound, um, rhodopsins, um, they're found in halophilic archaea. Again, absorb light energy, retinols, phycobilins are found in, in some algae and cyanobacteria. You can just see without having a PhD in chemistry that these look very different structurally. So light has figured out how to capture this energy from light over and over. So that makes you feel that it's, it's not that hard. What about taking the CO2 and reducing it? Light has figured out how to use multiple reductants. The same organism doesn't use the same one, but there are lots and lots of sources. There are lots of different ways that you can approach this problem. Sorry about the spelling there. What about enzymes that can actually make this happen? So this is actually what I proposed to work on when I came to Ames a gazillion years ago. Um, and I still think it's an interesting question. 
if you just start going through chemistry books and so on, it turns out there are about 18 carboxylating enzymes that light uses. Enzymes that will do the same thing in essence. They take carbon dioxide and they stick it on something else. Um, the big ones are, are things like pet carboxylates from Visco, which is what I worked on for my PhD. It's the most abundant protein in nature. It's the one that plants use for photosynthesis. Um, some of these actually are used to make fat. You said there's a picture of the rear end of a long back, but I can spare you that tonight. Um, so they do different things, but it looks like it evolved over and over again, this, this pattern. So are the physical factors in multiple places in our solar system and universe? Oh, sure, they're all over the place. And what about this argument from convergence? You get this idea of your basement organic carbon chemistry, you probably can figure out these components. So again, it makes you think, yeah, photosynthesis could happen other places. Okay, so let's try to get into some of these other fun moments. Symbiosis. So we're eukaryotes. Um, I don't usually have my husband in the room. I usually say, you know, we're eukaryotes and, you know, um, prokaryotes are very nice. You wouldn't want to marry one, except that I did. My husband is a specialist in prokaryotes. Um, by the way, anyone would like to give me a ride home tonight because I'm probably going to be walking home. Um, but we eukaryotes and the rest of us in the room are eukaryotes. Um, had an ancestry that started off with some kind of prokaryote that picked up another prokaryote, another bacterium, that ultimately became our mitochondria, some kind of alpha proteobacterium. Um, plants also picked up, uh, algae picked up a cyanobacterium, and then you get this sort of great of organization like a red alga, or that would be like us except for the we wouldn't need the chloroplast. And then those get eaten by other organisms, so you get secondary hosts, and there are plenty of organisms like that. And then there's a reduction, you get something like a cryptomonad. So this whole idea of things of sort of this Russian doll approach to evolution has actually occurred over and over. So once you start, that's not an unreasonable approach. Um, you acquire characteristics not by the usual sort of genetic mutation and selection, but you just swallow them, you pick them up. I mean, it's sort of like you want to be good at calling something, you buy an iPhone. You know, you want to be good at photosynthesis, swallow a chloroplast. So, organisms <laughs> don't <know. laughs> You're a wonderful person, by the way. I haven't mentioned that. Multicellularity. A lot of people are kind of arrogant. Well, we're multicellular and all those prokaryote things aren't. Here is a generalized tree of all life. And you can see there are three major domains, the bacteria, the archaea, which look very similar to bacteria, but are very different biochemically. And here we are, we eukaryotes that have a nucleus, carrion being nuts, or the true nuts, the nuclei. And out of that diversity, most of this are my friends, protists and algae and so on. Here are the three groups that are multicellular. So homo, we represent all man, um, animals. Um, here we've got zea, maize, uh, corn that represents all plants, and the coprinus, which is a, a fungus that represents all multicellular fungi. So multicellular organisms are really a very minor part of the diversity of life if you look at it from a genetic point of view. Obviously, if you look at biomass and so on, where lots of us are out there. So why would any organism want to do this? Well, one is you can get bigger, um, and you can get bigger without having to worry about diffusion. Because again, we're talking about physical limits. If you're going to need oxygen or CO2 for photosynthesis, somehow these gases have to get into the cell. And the bigger you get, the lower your surface area to volume ratio. I greatly believe that most of biology's problems boil down to surface area to volume ratio. <laughs> so you, you're like an elephant. You don't have much surface area to your volume. If you're like a snake, you've got lots and lots of surface area, and that's much better for diffusion. Um, but again, if you're made of lots and lots of little cells, you can get around some of these issues. You can coordinate. You can have some cells go senescent. I mean, if you're one cell, and there's something, your cell's damaged or it's dying, that's it. That's, you know, that's all she wrote. But if you're multicellular, we're constantly turning over cells. It's not a big deal. So you can have individual cells undergo senescence and recreate them through multicellular. And you can sequester your germline. You can say, all right, here are the eggs, here are the sperm. Just stay out of the way till we need them so that they stay away from the damage. So those are all good reasons to be multicellular. And it's a heck of an excuse to show you this picture when I was filming in um, Australia two years ago. It was great fun. It was for a, a film. And 
they just asked if I knew how to swim a couple weeks before, and I said, yeah. <laughs> and then two weeks before, what size wetsuit do you wear? I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so we're supposed to go to Shark Bay. Um, in the end, I ended up in Exmouth, and this is a whale shark, which is the largest sharks in the world. They're not, they're the largest sharks, but they are vegetarian. So this little teenager, there I am, here's the film crew. This guy is about um, 15, 17 feet long. And you know, you remind yourself that they're vegetarians, but if you're that big and you're having to live off plankton, your mouth's about this big, and you take one look at it and you say, Jonah and the whale. <laughs> but it really wasn't true. Anyway, side, side story. Um, what it, I'm going to tell you about one experimental um, study that was done that I did not do, but I admire enormously because I love studies that are incredibly simplistic. I, I say stupid in the nicest sense of the word. Um, Mike Travisano is a professor at the University of Minnesota, asked the question, could you make yeast multicellular? And he just took yeasts like he used to make bread or beer. And um, I'm sorry, I had to build there. The ancestral form looks like this. So this is what happens when you dissolve yeast to make bread or beer or whatever. And they bud off and make their babies that way. So this is the Tachymonyces cerevisiae. And this was, again, this is what a clever use of natural selection. They took these cells, they put them in fresh culture medium, they shook it up, and they sat there with a stopwatch for like 60 seconds. And whichever cells fell to the bottom, they took, they picked up with a pipette and put it in a fresh tube. And they did this um, over 60, I think 60 days or so. So 60 passages into new tubes. And at some point, they started to evolve, because the perception pressure was there, multicellular yeast, because they sunk so much faster. So they were selecting for any mutants that stuck together and became multicellular. Now, in fairness, the ancestors of yeast may have been multicellular, so they may have been sort of pre-adapted to this, having some of the genes. But I just love the way they were able to do this so quickly. So again, multicellularity. Great idea, doesn't seem all that hard to happen, and it's happened over and over again, not just with the big three. I took the picture out because it's really only for protistin aficionados, but a lot of protists, a lot of my friends, whether you're talking about kelp or seaweeds or a lot of these different ciliate groups and so on, are actually all multicellular, and it's been invented over and over again. Let's try to transition to land. We live on the land. A lot of plants live on the land. A lot of fungi live on the land. Um, why would you, and certainly lichens and bacteria and stuff, why would you want to go to the land? Um, well, there's a lot more gas up here. So if you're using carbon dioxide for photosynthesis or oxygen to breathe, and you're in a lake, and as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. So if you've got a warm can of Coke and you shake it, it's going to go if you get a cold can, it, you know, a cold can is going to stay calm because the solubility is better. So if you've got a high temperature lake, for example, and you're starting to get really low on the oxygen, a great place to go is out onto land. Of course, the problem is you're going to dry out, you're going to become desiccated, but you've opened new niches, you're escaping whatever predators were in that water, you know, maybe there are all sorts of sharks or whatever swimming around. So not a bad idea. There are problems, but there are advantages too. Lots of organisms have moved from water to land independently over and over. And so what I'm really talking about here in a backward way is, is it worth looking for organisms that are not a product on other planets? And yes, there are problems with it, but we have had that transition successfully over and over on planet Earth. So what about even something like human skin color? And I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of listening to Nina Jablonski when she was at the Cal Academy. I'm so sorry that she moved a while ago to the uh, University of Pennsylvania. But she and her husband worked on this, um, worked on it for quite a while, and had a very interesting story. And as Nina said, skin color is an adaptation of the environment, not a badge of genetic identity. So many think, people think, well, you get darker skin in high radiation areas because that protects you from skin cancer. She says that's kind of silly because you're not likely to have skin cancer that's in any way harmful um, in terms of, you know, well, even being fatal until after you've already had children. So in terms of natural selection, you wouldn't notice it at all. Um, but you need to protect yourself 
um, from the degradation of folic acid, which is really important for neural tube development in a growing um, fetus. And so you need to protect yourself from too much, but you need to have enough to make vitamin D so that you can have strong bones. So it's a balancing game. And if you look at this map of solar insulation without showing lots of pictures, you can see those places that are very high um, mapped to places where people have very dark skin. And this has occurred over and over. They'll move to, our ancestors will move to northern places where they're not getting much sunlight. Their skin goes light so they can get enough radiation so you can make vitamin D and grow strong bones. You get too much, you start to make more pigment so you can protect yourself. And again, it's gone up and down and up and down. So that's something that's very acute, acutely attuned to um, the solar insulation. So what about intelligence? Something that I am not probably qualified to talk about. Um, you probably had Seth Shostak talk here before from the SETI Institute, He's a marvelous speaker. And he and I were on a panel together years ago at the SETI Institute. And someone asked what the difference was between the two of us. And he quickly said, Lynn looks for stupid life and I look for an intelligent life. <laughs> and I have said for years I need a t-shirt. I have teased him about this mercilessly. And it's because I have a much better chance of finding something. <laughs> so who is the more intelligent? <laughs> so intelligence is really great if you're a predator. Um, except for a starfish, I don't really know any predator that hasn't developed more intelligence so they can go after active prey. Um, prey may or may not need intelligence to keep from being eaten. They may just have to be smarter, uh, faster. I always tell people, you don't have to be smarter to outrun a bear. You don't even have to be fast. You just have to be faster than the next guy. <laughs> and then there are people who believe, and I think they're probably right, that we became intelligent to deal with a very um, variable environment. So it gets cold, it gets hot, and so on. And we can't mutate fast enough to deal with it or lose our coats and grow a new one like maybe a dog can. And so our strategy was to be smarter. And that gets back to the idea that we're extremophiles. Yeah, it gets cold, we put on a coat. We don't have to grow a whole new set of fur, or, you know, new legs or whatever. We figured this out technologically. So um, I'd like to show you some interesting examples from mammalian convergence. And I particularly like to show you this because I spent hours last night redrawing this. So, you know, these mammalian, you know, all evolutionary biologists seem to move around their trees. They find a new fossil or they do some DNA sequencing evidence. The next thing you know, everything you learned in school is wrong. So I redrew all this last night. As of 24 hours ago, this was all based on paleontological data. This is now based more on the latest DNA data. So here is what the world might look like during the early Cretaceous, from around the time that San Francisco Sure astronomers were formed. And um, here is you know, the basal group, the eutheria. So we're not going to talk about duckbilled platypus tonight. So all of you wanted to do that and paid your money for it, you know, off you go. Um, so you've got the eutheria, and there's a big, you know, we now consider a big dichotomy there. Um, you've got the Atlantogen um, otta, which are the ones that were born around the Atlantic Ocean. And that have, includes two major groups. The acrotheria, which, interestingly enough, um, were evolved in Africa, and the xenarthra, which evolved in South America. So the acrotheria are a lot of your friends like tenrecs, golden moles, elephant shrews, aardvarks, manatees, hyraxes, elephants, and so on. So all of those originated in Africa. The xenarthra includes things like armadillos, anteaters, and sloths. So those are South American. This is the important part. And then here's this northern troop of sunnel mammals, the Boreo eutheria. And they have two major groups. And they split about 85 to 95 million years ago. And both of them evolved in Laurasia. So you're talking about North America um, and part of Europe, as they were closer at the time. The York of the Near East, which includes rodents, lagomorphs, so things like rabbits, tree shrews, and us, primates. Um, yeah, it, that was a little bit hard to swallow. I must say last night, the idea that we're now put in with rodents. So, <laughs> think about that next time you've got a mouse or a rat in the house. 
Um, and then there's the lower Asian <coughs> Terra, which includes shrews, pangolins, bats, whales, carnivores, odd toed, even toed, ungulates, and so on, so horses and so on. So I'm trying to simplify because then we can go into a lot of more subgroups. But let's look at these four major groups of mammals and where they originate so we know that they're separate lineages. <coughs> let's try this convergence. So again, let's go back to this idea of intelligence in mammals. So here we are, the primates. Here the bottom of those dolphins on a different branch, and we certainly can argue that they are intelligent. But you could say, well, they did have a common ancestor, even though the common ancestor is way back, and you don't see it in other places in our trees. But then you throw in the fact that elephants are arguably intelligent, and they're in that afrotherial line. And we could go back even further, and if you look at birds, um, there are some birds that are considered extremely intelligent. And um, I would like to submit to you that the octopus are very intelligent as well. That's why they're called cephalopods. Um, really clever. If, I don't know if anyone's had close-up experiences with octopus, but in, in my youth, when I was teaching invertebrates, I had to sort of babysit these octopus for two weeks at a time once a year. And they really, it's almost like dealing with a two-year-old. <laughs> They're at about that level of intelligence. So you give them flower pots, and they'll take one of their legs and put it in front of their eyes. It's like, I can't see you, so you can't see me. <laughs> it's like, like a toddler. It's like, yeah, you've got seven other tentacles sticking out. I actually can't see you. But you know, they'll do things like you put them to bed at night, and you think everything's fine. And you come in the next morning, and the fish that was in the other tank is missing. And he's looking around. And there's splash marks all over. And it's like, I know what you did during the night. You find out you got it, and you climb back in and think that I'm not going to notice this. You know, I mean, it really is sort of that, you know, mischievous. So there's no question that octopus are smart. So let's try another thing. Let's convergence of aquatic organisms. And there we've got the bottlenose dolphin again and a manatee in the Afrotheria. So both cases, these lineages were terrestrial and they went back to water. So they're secondarily aquatic. What about fossorial mammals? These are my least favorite group. These are the digging ones. Um, am I the only one in the room who hates pocket gophers with a passion because they have been eating your garden now for months. Okay, so there's a pocket gopher, arch enemy number one, top left there, a mole who would be arch enemy number one, except they're not found in our gardens here, and a golden mole, which is the apothearium. So this digging mode of life has arisen multiple times in multiple lineages. Ant eating seems to be a very nice way to make a living, get to play this game where you see ant eating evolving in three different of the four lineages. Now, um, as alluded to at the beginning, this makes a nice transition to your bonus talk. Um, about um, 11 years ago, I was, or so, I was asked to start a program in synthetic biology. And so, one of the things we've done is think can we use an experimental approach to start to answer some of these questions? So synthetic biology is basically design and construction of new biological functions and systems not found in nature. So it's like there's, there's descriptive chemistry, which we've been doing for thousands of years, and then there was synthetic chemistry that started about 150 years ago. Same thing in biology. We've been describing the organisms around us for literally thousands of years, but now we're able to do something new. We're doing something synthetic. And I think this is probably as good a way to describe it as any. So using some of these tools, is there going to come a time that we can take all these ideas I've told you about and make life de novo? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you use other amino acids. Maybe you use other compounds. But rather than just waiting to get the missions out to some exotic place and finding out, we've got a much better chance of trying some of these things in the lab and then asking ourselves, are we using realistic situations? The last thing I want you to consider when we talk about whether we could find something similar to us elsewhere um, are some of these externalities that we don't tend to think about. Maybe you do more as astronomers than I tend as a biologist. And I'll use some examples that Peter Ward gave from um, his Rare Earth book that uh, came out with Donald Brownlee quite a while ago now, but it's still a lot of interesting questions. And what they're particularly interested in is looking for a planet that has animal life. And one of the things you would look for is to have a planet that's a proper distance from a star. You know, it's sort of like, duh, if you're too close to the star, it's going to be too hot, and you've probably blown away your atmosphere from the solar wind and so on. If you're too far away, maybe it's too cold. Of course, 
there's a possibility of a habitable moon, and that's you know a whole other story. But I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, subtext and Celebus Europa and so on. Um, you might want to be a proper distance from the center of the galaxy so that you're not bombarded with radiation because you're in a high star forming region. You might want to have a star of proper mass, as I suggested before. Large stars are uh, burn fast and hot and die young. And so you might want to have one that's around a bit longer. Um, you might want to have a planet with proper mass so you can hang on to tectonic activity and hang on to your atmosphere. Poor little Mars wasn't able to do that. You might want to have oceans because then you've got liquid water. And also, if you don't have enough land, um, you might have an unstable atmosphere, so that could also be a problem. You might want to have a constant energy output from a star. Obviously, you need successful evolution. All things being equal, you want to avoid disasters. We had a terrible one 65 million years ago. You know, you can stay away from that. That's a good thing. And that's where, for example, um, having something like a Jupiter in your solar system that's so massively large and can change the trajectory of impactors might not be a bad thing. It's always possible that we are going to stay <laughs> thanks to Jupiter changing the orbit of an impactor. A large nearby moon like we have is very useful for maintaining your liquidity. And then plate tectonics for a stable atmosphere. You know, there are lots, none of these things would have prevented a microbial life form from developing on the Earth. But they may or may not have, some of them, uh, prevented us from having animals. But again, we don't know how long it would take. So I'm just trying to give the idea that it's not just chemistry we have to think about but we do actually have to feed in what we know about astronomy and the world outside of, of our test tubes. So what is going on there in Westminster Abbey at night when um, Newton says, ha ha, F equals MA, I believe Darwin can say, well, there are certain things we can predict about life, even if we can't define it with an H2O definition today, enough that we get some first cut, rough cut on where to go to look for life elsewhere. I do think that we would still be organic carbon chemists, and that we can argue some of this <coughs> from convergence. So um, I wanted to end there because that was, you know, um, that was quite a bit, and I realized very philosophical. And then, if I can do that, give you a quick sort of update on where we are on Eucrobus um, as of when I was being introduced. Um, let's see. I think. And so I already mentioned that about um, 11 years ago or so, I was um, asked by our central director at the time, Pete Warden, who's now head of the Breakthrough Foundation, um, to start a program in synthetic biology for the agency. So there I was, a perfectly mild-mannered astrobiologist, you know, looking for Martians. You know, it's a day job and all that sort of stuff. And next thing I know, I'm told to go out and look at synthetic biology. And as I mentioned, synthetic biology, I believe, can help us answer questions and search for life elsewhere. But um, there are other things, and this was, I think, part of Pete's primary concern, and certainly is a very important argument, that as we go forth from planet Earth, we leave our water and trees and, and so on, and the Earth starts to recede in the distance. Um, I'm sure most everyone here will recognize this picture. I used a little doctored um, Earth there. This is the Earth rise that Frank Borman took, I believe it was Christmas Eve. And I'm reminding you of the exact date because it's 50 years ago coming up next, uh, next Monday night, I guess. So very exciting. And this picture really has become an iconic picture, I think, for humankind. And we will go further than that. Hopefully in our lifetime, people ask, are we going to the moon? You know, are we going to go to Mars? Of course we are. But it almost doesn't count if it's in 200 years. We want to see it, right? We are in a lifetime. And so when you get to a place like Mars, and this is an actual photograph from the surface, the Earth becomes even more remote. And so you can't rely on it for you know, constant feedback in your daily activities. Can everyone find the Earth here? Thank you for the person who said yes, and for the rest of you, there she is. So you can see that this is something that our, our descendants are going to look at the Earth up in the sky, and maybe they're going to learn about it in a history class, you know, like we have to learn American history in high school, maybe they learn Earth history and take an exam, and maybe it turns out it's a, a you know, really 
exotic school vacation or a really fancy honeymoon or you know who knows how are they going to think about this but certainly the time that they're on Mars they're going to have to be much more independent and they're going to need a lot of the things that we need even on um, planet Earth so they're going to need transportation on some bicycles they're going to need life support food oxygen medicine waste recycling clothing by the way all this applies to the moon as well they're going to need habitats power heat light um, and radiation protection much more than you need in Berlin in the middle of November, um, and a communication system. So here are all these needs that we're going to have, but we have constraints. We have a lot of challenges that um, you don't have on the Earth. And the big one there is up mass, so anything you launch into orbit and beyond is very expensive, roughly $10,000 um, to get a, a, a like can of Coke into low Earth orbit. Um, if you want to go to the moon or Mars, it's going to cost you more. Depends you know, if you go commercial or not. So this is tied to the cost. You have to worry about storage. You have to worry about reliability and flexibility. As I always say, Amazon.com just is not going to deliver overnight there, and I don't care how much you pay. Um, the power, you're going to need all these things. And we firmly believe that the solution to a lot of these problems is life itself. If you start looking at life as a technology, you can solve a lot of that. Think of that mass problem. You don't need to take a strawberry plant or a tree. You can take a seed and grow it on site. That's the inspiration. So we can then take synthetic biology and help reprogram it. So maybe we don't have the form factor we want, but we leverage off the work that's going on in materials and manufacturing, environmental control, fuels, and so on on the earth, pharmaceuticals, and we apply that to settlement on the moon and Mars. So the big idea, for example, is we're going to use organisms for material production, just like we do on the Earth today. So here's a shot that I took outside of Glasgow last summer, and you can see the sheep producing wool, producing meat, producing leather, if you want that. Um, we're not going to take sheep. We're not going to take trees and so on. We might take a seed, but that's going to be very difficult to grow a tree there to <coughs> lumber. We're not going to take sheep. It's not a Noah's Ark thing. But we do have to remember that we have all these bioproducts that could be very useful in <coughs> silk or cotton or wood or latex um, or spider silk. We are going to take something like this. This is a bacterium called Bacillus subtilis. See those um, very bright yellowish um, oval things? Those are endospores. And this is why I'm so bullish on Bacillus subtilis because they do form these really resistant spores, and they've actually been flowing in space to almost six years on the long-duration exposure facility, LDAP. So these guys have proven themselves as being amazing astronauts. So why not take the Bacillus subtilis and engineer them to make all these things? So you take the capabilities out of one form factor, whether it's a sheep or a silkworm or whatever, you engineer Bacillus subtilis so it now makes cotton or silk or latex or whatever, and you take that with you. And so then we can do all sorts of things with synthetic biology, nanotechnology, electricity, and so on. And this is a whole other lecture, so I'm not going to give you all the examples. But to do all this off planet, we've got to get some idea how things like gravity are going to affect these processes. So I can say we need to do this on Mars based on what I do in the lab. Um, and people like Jessica snuck in, which she's done some wonderful work with bioprinting and some of these, um, some of these technologies. Um, but maybe it's going to be different. Maybe if we're in lunar gravity, um, things are going to work better or they're going to work worse and how much better it works. Or in Martian gravity, different radiation and so on. And so it would be really nice to be able to test that. And about five years ago, I got the opportunity to do this. The Germans um, planned for this Eucropus satellite. The Eucropus is because um, it's the Eulina crops in space, and I'm going to let Rock and talk for a second about that payload. That's the German payload in there. But we were given this wonderful opportunity at NASA Ames to put an experiment, a little payload, in the outer parts of the satellite. It's an artist's conception. And so um, this is not how it's supposed to be done, but I got a call um, on a Friday night from Germany um, and I was asked, look, if you could, you could put a payload in a small microfluidics card and get it to fly at gravity regime that mimics ISS, the International Space Station, um, and then the moon, and then Mars, what would you do? And by the way, we wanted to have to do a synthetic biology. I thought, I've got to find something. You, 
you know, I've been at NASA forever, and it's not like people walk up to you every day and say, hi, would you like a ride into space? <laughs> like, no one has. So it's like, yes, yes, please, I'll think of something. And um, my brand sheet at the time said I was wasting my time, but I said, look, if it does go, this is an amazing opportunity. And cut to the chase, of course, it did. So this is what's actually going on with the Eucropus mission. Um, and this, it's a, um, say exciting because it's it's spinning at different gravity uh, different rates to mimic different gravity regime and this main payload here is payload one is what it's named after this Eucropus rock. You want to just stand up and quickly explain what that experiment's about? Thank you. If if people can hear me, sure. Uh, what it is is we're flying an ecosystem, a closed ecosystem, but it's not just any ecosystem. It is an ecosystem that also serves as a water purification system as well as a plant growth system. So what we have is we have a greenhouse with small miniature tomato plants. We have a growth, a euglena tank to produce oxygen, and the heart of the whole thing is a lava rock bed full of dirt, basically, and microbes that live in dirt that's full of water. And what we do I said it's a water purification system, is we take habitat water, which consists of urine, <coughs> that consists of condensate from the walls of the habitat, feed it into this, this water system with the lava rock. The microbes work on that. They produce fertilizer for euglena to grow. They produce the fertilizer for the plants to grow, and the euglena produces oxygen to keep the whole thing aerobic, so that we have, hopefully, a complete system for growing plants and purifying water. And the idea is to look, what is the effect of a gravity, different gravity regimes on ecosystem function and development, especially this particular kind. So that's why we're looking at nitrogen cycling in particular, because that's the fertilizer, what happens if you're growing in, uh, on, on the moon and you want to grow plants and you want to use this kind of a system for water purification as well, or on Mars? Is there going to be effect or is there not? And if there is an effect, is it a deleterious effect and how strong is it and how would you correct it if there is an effect? So in a nutshell, that's it. Tomatoes in space. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, their experiments are going to run a good deal longer, and the whole spacecraft's only going to be at this mimicking ISS for about a month. Um, probably wouldn't have even been that long, but we've now delayed it to Christmas, and the Germans have announced they're going to be on minimal status starting Friday for the holidays. Um, so what we have is what I call power cell, and let me explain what the idea of this um, experiment is. So, as I alluded to before, this is basically how ecology works on planet Earth. We have the raw materials like the sun, and carbon dioxide, and water, and some minerals in the soil, and primary producers like plants take these raw materials and inputs and um, make fixed carbon. They make sugars, and then from the sugars, the proteins and nucleic acids, and so on. Secondary producers, like a cow, could then eat the primary producers and they could be eaten by something else. But for this example, what I'm going to say is that the secondary producers can then produce products that we use, whether it's cotton, um, uh, wool for a sweater, or leather, or meter, or whatever. Um, obviously, cotton would come straight from the primary producer. Now, what if instead of using things like cows and grass, we swap this out and we're now using microbes? So here are some cyanobacteria that are able to take the carbon dioxide and put the photosynthesis, make sugars and so on, just like before, but they can also take nitrogen from the atmosphere and make fixed nitrogen, like ammonia, that organisms can use. You now have a producer cell, you should recognize that as a bacillus subtilis, and you could make something like cotton. You could engineer it to produce cellulose. Now just take this little ecosystem and take it off planet Earth and plunk it down in some place like Mars and that's our whole concept of power cell. So what we wanted to do is test this whole thing because all these other great ideas that I didn't talk about tonight rely on having this input 
of, of an organism that interfaces between the raw materials on a planet, just like the way it's worked on planet Earth, and producer cells that can make, let's say, the latex or the cellulose or whatever. Um, and so that that's the, was the original intent, um, and still is going to be true of some of, of the experiments there. But I was given a microfluidics card that you'll see in a, a moment with 48 wells, and I'm trying to get as much for our, um, NASA's money as possible. Um, and so since they were very interested in the synthetic biology, we not only wanted the, the overall idea, but also to try some basic synthetic biology technologies. So for example, transformation, where you take DNA from one organism or something that you've completely synthesized and made it yourself, <coughs> and put it in a cell, like a bacillus subtilis, and boot it up and get it to function. So it's almost, if you're not in the business, it's almost like taking your cell phone and adding an app. You're adding an app to a cell. So um, this doesn't need to be as scary as some of the stuff you might read about. It might be something like um, an organism that doesn't normally fix its own nitrogen, like bacillus subtilis. What if it could then fix its own nitrogen? That would be enormously helpful to the organism and particularly, you know, growing off planet where you don't want to also have to bring fertilizer. Um, or the capability to make cellulose or latex or, you know, all these sorts of things you're talking about. And part of what you want to make are, are products like maybe pharmaceuticals. Um, actually, Jess and I just submitted a proposal to do, um, just in time, uh, customized pharmaceuticals off planet. So there are a lot of reasons that you want to put new bits of DNA into a cell. So that's called transformation. So this is what the flight card looks like that we use. We have um, two payload modules on either side of the satellite in the outer shell. And each module has two of these cards. So one row, we have yet another experiment where we're looking at production of proteins, um, which is kind of interesting because you have to have um, a, something in the cell to tell the uh, protein to be produced. Um, so you have what are called promoters. So we have some of these with a promoter that is working all the time, and some with the promoter that's going to be sensitive to stress. So what we see here is when, when these promoters turn on the gene, there'll be a blue dye formed. And so each of these wells actually has a little spectrophotometer in. So what we will be getting back, hopefully by tomorrow morning, <laughs> measurements of how blue each well looks. And you can see we've filled up some there just so you can get an idea what it looks like. So this will be a protein production row. And there are 12 wells in each of these four rows. Some of them are controls, some of them are replicas, and so on. The second one will be looking at the bacillus subtilis and how fast it grows under the three different gravity regimes. We have some idea on what should happen from things like the International Space Station, but it's nice that we have the controlled experiments here where we're doing the three gravity regimes. Of course, we're doing everything also in our lab, so we've got one G as well. This next row is going to be this real power cell experiment. Um, we were very concerned about leaving dried cyanobacteria in there for long periods of time, and it turns out we were right to be concerned. Um, I was, there's no other word for it, forced to load these things into the um, microfluidics cards. And I wish I were kidding you, May of 2016, so they've been in there for long enough to go to Mars and back. Um, so in the end, we cheated a little bit. Instead of putting cyanobacteria in there, we grew them up in my lab and lysed them and put the lysate. So we just skipped the step of growing it, but everything else will be this cyanobacteria lysate feeding the bacillus subtilis. We'll see how they do compared to like a commercial growth medium. And then finally, this last row will be the transformation, which I have a somewhat dim view about. I'm trying to lower expectations because our ground control suggests, again, that, that two and a half years was just too long to leave all this dry. Um, I should add that because it's on German satellite, we loaded everything at NASA Ames. It then was shipped over to Germany where it was integrated into the satellite. It was then shipped back to California and launched from Vandenberg. That's more details in the wells. Um, December 3rd, 2018. Um, I went down with Rocco to see the launch. SpaceX was the contractor, and it got delayed and delayed and delayed. It's already been delayed two and a half years. I had a proposal to two days later, and we made the wrong decision. We drove back, and sure enough, less than 12 hours later, it launched. Ouch. Fortunately, 
I have um, some wonderful people in my lab, and one of them had gotten, as we were driving back, got up early, and um, Brazilian, Yvonne, who worked with me on this, and these, this film of the launch taken by Brazilian film crew.
it's an amino acid. Every cell in your body is making proteins, and they can't say, well, it's going to be somewhere between 50 and 2,000 long, like someone maybe in nanotechnology. By God, you better have every amino acid exactly where it belongs. So our bodies are doing that every day. Every base pair in your DNA better be there, or you can end up with hemophilia or a heck of a lot worse. Um, so it's a matter of harnessing that capability of organisms. And we've been, you know, and Jess and I have been talking about that a lot too, that I strongly believe that you can use biology for nanotechnology. Um, and let me give you one other example of a really exciting project that's been going on in, um, in my lab too. Um, it's really the brainchild and spearheaded by a PhD student at Columbia working with me off and on for years. Um, and what he's come up with is a way to take the DNA double helix and insert single silver atoms um, exactly where he wants them. So it's he's electrifying the DNA double helix and using that as a wire. And then going the next step with DNA origami. So think about all those things actually should be dead cheap, absolutely specific, scalable. So I'm really actually very bullish that it's not life versus nanotechnology, but the light is an enabling way to do nanotechnology. That was a lot longer answer than you wanted. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, uh, it might be a little bit off the subject, but maybe not. One of the, the questions now is about the famous Fermi paradox mm -hmm. of all these planets and, yep. and, and all the different kinds of life that there might be. It, 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 you see a fundamental biological reason why we we haven't heard from any form of life with all these enormous number of possibilities of places to hear from. Right. So I mean, obviously, there there are a lot of possibilities. One is they don't have the technology. Two, they've got the technology, and we don't have the technology. We're not listening to them properly. I mean, think about it. The SETI Institute defines intelligence as um, anyone who can build a radio transmitter. So again, you know, I'm, I'm at the front ranks of the stupid. You know, <laughs> every human being that's ever lived, it's only a tiny fraction who could receive a radio signal and get anything out of it. So that, you know, so we may just be missing it. They may not want us to hear them. Um, but usually the Fermi is, is less the hearing from as much as physically showing up. And that doesn't bother me at all. Because if you go back to my idea that life's based in organic carbon <coughs> chemistry, um, it's going to be very difficult to get from solar system to solar system. And there's going to be a lot of um, damage and repair that you're going to have to shield from. You're going to need food and so on. <coughs> and it's probably not going to be worth it. Well, I would guess for the foreseeable future, as far as I can imagine, we're going to be sending our robotic surrogates. So you send probes out like we've done with our solar system, and you listen in, and you learn what you can, and you report back. Now, I mean, if we're going to really go sci-fi, I actually, we all know the sun's getting hotter and hotter. I think that we're going to start using the Earth as a spaceship, but that's like a whole other thing, and I'm not a astronomer. <laughs> Yeah, I understand their technical difficulties, but that's not my job. Yeah, I can't solve all NASA's problems. So it doesn't bother me that we haven't heard from them. Or they may not be at the point that they, they have the technological capability to contact us, or they say they may not want to. Uh, I'm sorry, I have no idea who was first. Linda. Uh, I was going to say you might. Is it, you have a few moments after, and then they can come to you. Absolutely. Is that good? Absolutely, and I would strongly recommend anyone who wants to hear more about that primary payload on Eucopus to talk to Rocco, and anyone who wants to hear about all the cool stuff in bioprinting, I'm going to embarrass the life out of her, go see Jessica, because she's really our, our specialist in it. I'm sorry, it's so cold. It's warm outside. It's just suddenly something. Ah, subversion. <laughs> the aliens. It's the aliens. <laughs> anyway, San Francisco Avengers Conference is delighted you were here tonight. Oh, well, thank and you so much. to thank you with the certificate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.